and my name is Anne McClellan. I'm a part-time lecturer in the National College of Art and Design, where I teach history of medicine and medical devices. I'm also a medical scientist working in microbiological surveillance in Connolly Hospital in Blanchardstown. Um, I've always been interested in the history of um, women and their participation in science, technology, medicine and engineering. And I've been an active member of the group Women in Technology and Science who have tried to promote the role of women in STEM. Well, I think it would be fair to say that until the late 19th century, a uh, few of any women had the opportunity to develop the skills to participate in um, science and medical and health research on equal terms with men. So I suppose it puts into a wider societal context. Women couldn't vote. They uh, couldn't participate in public society, in government, in law, in politics until the mid to the late 19th century. So their sphere was seen essentially as domestic. They were child bearers, they were child rearers. They were there to support their husbands who were the people who were going to have the careers and be out there doing the research. And I suppose the main barrier to women's participation in science and medicine and in research was their lack of literacy. Even for middle and upper class women who would have been educated to a certain level and who would have been literate, they were not educated in the same way as men were. Men were educated um, with the anticipation that they would have a career or that they would go to college, whereas women were educated simply so that they would be literate and they could function within a domestic setting. So no matter how well educated they were then women, even if they did manage to access the same education as their brothers, they weren't admitted to universities. So they simply could not become researchers until the 19th, the end of the 19th century. Essentially, there were different expectations for men and different expectations for women, um, as well as structural, societal and legal barriers. So I suppose to go back to the beginning, um, women lack the education. Do they also lack capacity is something that's often asked. Did our great great grandmothers have smaller or less agile brains than our great great grandfathers? And um, obviously to us looking back, we're, we're going to stand up and say, of course they didn't. But there was quite a different um, thought in you know the prevalence the prevalent the prevalent thought at the time was that women were essentially less capable than men so if you look at say an eminent uh, philosopher like aristotle fourth century bc what does he have to say about women he says the physical texture of the female brain made women incapable of rational thought now ironically if he'd lived on for another century, he would have seen Hypatia, a fellow countrywoman, a Greek mathematician who made major advances in maths carrying on the work of her father. Now, unfortunately, Hypatia was the exception that seemed to prove the rule that women and research didn't mix. There were occasional breakthrough flashes of brilliance by a very few women in the sciences, but these were exceptions. And there were largely women who had access to science, like Hypatia, through their fathers or their brothers. So the historian Mary Cullen notes, that when we see women in their historical context, it becomes clear that it doesn't make sense to judge their value of their contribution by counting and comparing what we call great female and male scientists. The lack of women in this roll call doesn't prove that women were naturally less good at science than men. It just is about lack of opportunity. So there's still debate about innate gender differences when it comes to male and female brains and how they're wired. But I personally believe that power, politics, social and economic circumstances were probably stronger determinants of the participation or lack of participation of women in medical and scientific research than anything to do with their actual brain composition. I suppose as well, we need to widen this out a little bit. We're saying women couldn't participate and gender was very important in the historical context, but there were many other limiting factors for participation for individuals. So nationality, class, color, wealth, lack of wealth, education, lack of it, religion, age and marital status. In her um, forward to the book, Star Shells and Bluebells, 
which is a collection of mini biographies of Irish women scientists and um, doctors and engineers. The historian Mary Cullen writes that almost all the women featured in this collection of Irish female scientists were members of the middle or upper classes. They belonged to a minority. They had relative freedom. They had leisure to study. Um, um, but at the same time, they weren't participating in what we'd have seen as state supported science and state supported science in Ireland in the late 19th and early 20th century was largely the preserve of the dominant social and cultural classes. So we're talking about mainly Protestant ascendancy. But being a woman in the middle or upper Protestant um, ascendancy was not enough. You generally needed some other kind of access. So maybe through your fathers and brothers who had labs at home, you could get some access to equipment. You've tended to see women looking at areas like um, botany and astronomy, where the instruments might be in the houses. Sometimes these women did significant research and this was published in male names, or it may have been added on as an addendum to male research as an acknowledgement. And of course, this was not peculiar to Ireland. Hilary Rose, who writes about the British context in her book, Beyond masculinist realities, a feminist epistemology for the sciences. She says that during the early 19th and 20th century, science is still something of a craft industry in which daughters enjoyed and wives enjoyed a certain privileged access to laboratories. And then Aileen Fife, who wrote the foreword to Lab Coats and Lace, which is the follow on to Star Shells and Bluebells, is another collection of mini biographies of Irish women scientists. She noted by the end of the 1800s, science was becoming a profession. And the need for formal qualification from universities then, um, which were closed to women, in her words, were a more effective bar to women's participation in the sciences than the social conventions of an earlier era. So just to illustrate this, I'm going to talk about somebody from that era who, um, Maud, Maud Jane Delap, and you can see her here pictured in the slide. So Maud was born in 1866. She was an, she's an example of a female scientific researcher who never had the opportunity to go to university. She was a clergyman's daughter, so a Protestant clergyman. She lived on Valentia Island in Kerry, which was then quite remote because the bridge that's there now wasn't there to the mainland, so you had to row across. Seems an unlikely place to become a researcher. However, in 1890, Valentia was chosen as the site for a detailed marine um, study. And a number of researchers from University College London were dispatched over to Valencia. Now, obviously, these were all men. Um, when they left the island, their work was carried on by Maud and her sister, Constance. And the whole study was published in the Royal Irish Academy in 1899. And it duly gives thanks to the Mrs. de Lapp, who for some years had taken a great interest in the marine fauna at Zed of the Harbour, gave us invaluable assistance, and their work is recorded in most of the reports. They're not cited as authors. In fact, most of their, their reports are predicated on their work and their samples, and the papers could never have been published without their work. So later then, after they had left, Maud works alone in a room in the rectory that she ironically christened the department, because this was the time when there were lots of new different government departments um, coming into being. And she elucidated the complex um, life cycle of a jellyfish. And her work did begin to be recognised and in the early 1900s she was offered a job with the Marine um, Biological Station in Plymouth. So her father's response, and her father would have been a very liberal man who had allowed them to be educated, who was very happy for his daughters to have the lab and to conduct research and so on, but he just said, no daughter of mine will leave home except as a married woman. And I think that kind of says it all. Now, Maud's contribution um, is to the literature, the published literature is quite small, but um, there is a sea anemone named after her, Edwardsia de Lapiace, was something she found in the eelgrass in Valencia. So her contribution has been recognised to a certain extent, but obviously if she'd had better access, she would have been able to do much more substantial research. Laura Kelly, who I think is participating in another one of the podcasts in this series, has studied women's participation in medicine, and she's written a book on Irish women in medicine, 1880s to 1920s, discussing the role of these women. So around this time, there were six medical colleges in Ireland. So we had Trinity, the oldest college there from 1592, the Royal College of Surgeons, founded in 1784, 
the Queen's Colleges in Cork, Galway and Belfast, established in the 1840s. The Catholic University, which becomes UCD, was founded in 1851. And then uh, besides those, we also had the Royal College of Physicians, which was founded in 1654, and Apothecaries Hall, founded in 1793, who offered licenses to people who had studied and who could be now be registered to practice. Prior to the late 1800s, there were some women in medicine, um, particularly among the barber surgeons, because the barber surgeons were separate to the physicians and you didn't need a university qualification to practice as a barber surgeon. But unfortunately, we don't know an awful lot about these women. We do know the first woman on the official medical register, which was established after the um, Medical Registration Act of 1858, was Elizabeth Blackwell, who was um, born in England and brought up in the States. So around this time in Ireland, the RCPI played a really pioneering role in allowing women who had taken their medical degrees abroad to sit their license exams from 1877. The colleges were letting them sit their degrees, but they weren't allowing them to practice at the end of it, and this bridged that gap. The RCSI and the Queen's Colleges also allowed women to take exams from the late 1800s. UCD was a bit later off the block, 1898, and Trinity was the slowest of all, and it didn't open its doors to female students until unbelievably 1904. So an example of an early Irish female doctor who has become very well known for her contributions to medical science in Ireland is Darcy Stockford Price. Most people are familiar with her because she introduced BCG vaccination to Ireland. She also did a huge amount of epidemiological research on tuberculosis in Ireland. And um, you see her here in this slide. By her death in 1854, sorry, in 1954, I should say, Dorothy was recognised on the world stage as a medical researcher of note. Now, she went to Trinity in 1916, which was 12 years after Trinity had first opened its doors to women. She was typical in her background. She came from an elite Protestant family. And while in Trinity, she could study alongside the male students but there were other barriers there to um, research. Susan M. Parks has written a book which is somewhat provocatively titled A Danger to the Men, A History of Trinity, 1904 to 2004. And she notes that in 1918, the Dublin University Experimental Association was open to women, but what she calls tactful arrangements had to be put in place because it was a 6 p.m. curfew for women who had to be off the campus by then. So the female students had to gather at Lincoln Gate. They had to be met by the female register. She took them in. They were chaperoned throughout the meeting and then she shepherded them safely off the premises again. So the male, men were safe. Dorothy, however, even though she could go to that particular society, was really angry that she was excluded on the grounds of her gender from the Dublin University Biological Association. And this was an association where people could go and present cases or present research findings and they could be discussed. So it would have been a very important society to get into if you planned to become a researcher. So in 1919, Dorothy decided to go into battle on behalf of third, fourth and fifth year medical students. And when I was looking through her papers in Trinity, I found the following petition, which was sent to the Secretary of the Biological Association. And I'm just going to read this out because it sort of says a lot. We understand that there was no provision in the statute book against the admission of women students to the Bi Association. The only objection we can see is that it's contrary to the traditions of Trinity. But in the past few years, the political and professional position of women in Ireland and in the world has changed. In addition, the increasing numbers of women in the medical school and the concession of equal advantages granted to them in that school and in the Dublin hospitals and the honours that they've gained, they feel justified in putting forward this request. So what happens? The motion was put to the society and it was roundly defeated. 102 votes against two votes in favour of allowing women in. And this is 1919. So this hard line continued and 10 years later, in 1929, Dorothy's graduated from Trinity and female students are allowed into the meetings, but they can't present their work. In 1935, she wants to present some of her work at the by, so she asks a male colleague, Gareth Hardiman, to present it. He does and he says, 
thanking her. It's unfortunate that your sex debarred you from showing us your case yourself. This is no reflection on you, of course. In another 50 years or so, we may admit female members, and he puts a question mark after that. It didn't take quite that long. In 1947, women were admitted to full membership of the Bi. So that's kind of unbelievable in a way. When I started second level education, the marriage bar, which meant that women who were in certain public service jobs had to leave their jobs when they got married, it was still in place. It was in place for my mother, who was working in London in the Irish Embassy and had to resign immediately she got married. When I started school, I didn't even know anything about it and I didn't realise it was still in place. Luckily, by my intercert, by the junior cert, it was gone. So my interest then in female participation in science was spurred by my membership of the campaigning organisation Women in Technology and Science. And under the editorship of the late Mary Mulfell, as I say, we produced two volumes of mini biographies of Irish women scientists and engineers. And this was fascinating. I was just given the names of a number of women to research and I knew nothing about them and just trying to trawl back and, you know, find out what their role had been was absolutely incredible. So you'd say then, well, now all the barriers are down. Why did women in technology and science need to resurrect these women? We were trying to bring forward role models because women's participation in STEM was still very low. Um, there was no overt reason for women not to shine in the sciences, but there still seemed to be issues in relation to participation and advancement. We could qualify in medicine and science. There were no apparent barriers to research, but women were still not making the impact that we thought they should have been. And then in 1997, a new light was shone on the issue. And I remember this really well because I had worked in immunology and was now working in microbiology. And this was an immunologist and a microbiologist from Sweden who put together this study. And their study kind of made headlines all over the world. The new scientist ran the headline, sex bias study shocks the world, science in full caps is rife with prejudice. And it said the first ever study to compare objective measures of the quality of scientists work with the subjective ratings they're given by other researchers when applying for grants has revealed that, that women have to be two and a half times more productive than men in order to get the same peer review ratings. And this is in Sweden, a country that is named by the UN as the world leader in sexual equality. So what did they do? Christine Wenner was the microbiologist and Agnes Wold was an immunologist and they worked in Gothenburg um, in Sweden. And they had seen that women seemed to be only half as successful as men when they were competing for postdoctoral fellowships from Sweden's Medical Research Council. And this was obviously very personal to them as well. So they wanted to see whether female applicants were really rated objectively. So what they did was they asked to see the evaluation scores and the research council refused twice to release the data and then only after a court battle and with the help of Sweden's freedom of information legislation they got their hands on the evaluation documents. And of course in theory the women might not have been doing as well as men, they might have been of poorer quality, their work might have been of poorer quality but when Ren Wohl decided to test for this by looking at an established measure, which is the impact of published work. So rather than simply taking a scientist's total number of publications into account, they looked at impact, which measures the weight, which weighs each paper according to the average number of times papers in that journal are cited by other scientists in a calendar year. So they showed that women and men with the same publication impact were awarded vastly different scores for scientific competence by their peers. And this was published in Nature. And Wenner has said, I don't think that they were consciously discriminating. She was now working at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, but there's a tendency to overvalue men's achievements and to undervalue women's. So that's 1997. And today, I suppose you could ask, what's the situation? Female medical students are the norm. In 1898, 0.8% of medical students were women. 2008, almost 75% of medical students were women. And ironically, it seems the introduction of the HPAT in 2008 was an in part an attempt to address gender imbalance and sway it back to allow more men in. So globally, women seem to be doing well in research and science. Um, 
yet the belief persists that mathematics and the hard sciences are for men and for all women entering a research career there is the difficulty of combining motherhood with the demands of such a career and it does seem strange to have to state this in 2020 that without women taking the time to become pregnant and to nurture babies and young children then the male world and indeed the whole human world would cease to exist so far from recognizing this unique contribution of women to humankind they're penalized as they stay away from the workplace during what is seen as these vital early career years. So this slide shows you Marie Curie, who received the Nobel for um, chemistry and also the Nobel for physics. She got her first Nobel in 1903. And the count last year was that there were 866 men and 57 women had obtained the Nobel Prize. The so women, even though all the barriers were down, etc., etc., still not doing very well. And for me, the headline in Forbes magazine last month, October 2020, it indicates that there is still a glass ceiling or a perception of a glass ceiling, ceiling for women with respect to research. So Forbes said, Nobel Prize winners in chemistry and physics discuss shattering gender norm, redefining women's roles. And this for me now is sort of 30 years after I first joined Women in Technology and Science and started looking at these things and asking these questions. And it still seems that when the two women um, won the chemistry prize for the Nobel this year, immediately we're starting to focus on the fact that they are women and suggesting that this once again is redefining women's roles. So the article in Forbes explains that the first Nobel in chemistry was awarded 119 years ago and on Wednesday for the first time in its history two women won without having to share the prize with a man without with a man because Marie Curie did share her prize with men her husband for her first prize. Their groundbreaking development may shift the perception of women in scientific roles and continue to disrupt the centuries old mindset that women are second to men in innovation or any field. So pictured in this slide, we have Jennifer Doudna, who is a biochemist at UC Berkeley and the French researcher, Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier of the Max Planck Institute. And they accepted the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for developing the CRISPR genetic scissors, a technology that can rewrite DNA in cells. And hopefully this will um, enable treatment of diseases like sickle cell anemia and muscular dystrophy. But what, well, while she explained this and the value of CRISPR, Doudna also said, I really hope this is breaking that glass ceiling so that in future it's not surprising that two women or more win awards. And just to mention the other woman, Dr. Andrea Ghez, an astronomer and physics professor at UCLA, who also made a mark as the fourth woman in history to win a Nobel Prize in physics, a prize that was first won by um, Marie Curie, as I said, in 1903. So to kind of to sum up and reflect back on this, how different would it have been if women had been able to participate equally in research in medicine and health and science? you know, from the get-go? Very difficult question to answer. Historians hate these what-if questions. And I suppose it would have to be broadened way out. There's no way that women could have been enabled to participate in research in medicine, health and science without lots of other things being in place first. So they would have had to be, of course, literate and numerate. They would have had to have equal access to education and really for them to be allowed in, they would have needed equal access to the political and the sort of social and economic, you know, situation in a way that they didn't have. So I think it would have been a very different world if women had been allowed into research from the beginning or if they'd been provided or allowed to access those tools. It wouldn't have just been science and medicine that it would have been different, it would have been the entire world would have been different to allow this to happen.